Let's begin with prayer. Our gracious God, our most heavenly Father, you who are holy, 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 we thank you for this morning that we can again gather as your people corporately. Lord, we thank you for bringing us through yet another week. And now that we can begin this new week, reminded of your grace and even being set for, sent forth in that grace as you give to us that glorious word of benediction. We thank you, O Lord, for these reminders. We ask that even now as we consider the topic of reading Scripture and preaching the Scriptures, we ask that you would be with us and that you would help us to learn and grow in righteousness and holiness. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I believe this is week seven, I think, of our time together. So we are now covering reading Scripture and preaching in Scripture. And just sort of to frame the discussion, what we want to look at is, again, the warrant, the biblical warrant for both of those things in our worship service, and then consider primarily those in the pews. What, are the, what, are the, what is the congregation called to do? We're not going to so much uh, describe what the preaching should be. That's worthy of discussion, certainly. Um, but primarily, what are we to do as we sit and listen to the preaching? Maybe a topic that doesn't get really discussed much at all. So that's where we're headed. Just before we sort of get into those two topics, though, I did want to just take a step back and remind us what are we doing in this class, just to sort of remind all of us what we are doing, primarily two things that I hope we've been seeing. One, we've been trying to demonstrate from Scripture that what we do in the worship service each Lord's Day is actually warranted by God's Word. So I hope we've been seeing that, the different elements that we do. There is scriptural warrant. So if somebody were to walk in and say, why do you guys do what you do in worship? We can say, because we believe the Bible calls us to do these things in worship. I hope we've been at least seeing that. The second thing that I really want us today, particularly but all of these weeks, is to help us see as congregants, those who are often thinking that I am being passive in the worship service, I really hope we're seeing that it is actually the congregation that is to be active. It's not just those who lead worship that are the active participants, but that the congregation has a part to play, a vital part. Uh, to play in the service of worship. I've alluded to this, I've spoken about the OPC has this directory for public worship. It gives guidelines for how the denomination thinks, according to scripture, the congregation should worship. This is what it says, though, about the activity of the congregation. It says the triune God, the triune God is not a passive spectator in, in public worship, but actively works in each element of the service of worship. So that's reflecting on what God is doing in our service of worship. What about what we are doing? They say, neither are the people of God to be passive spectators in public worship, but by faith are to participate actively in each, in each element of the service of worship. And so today we're thinking, how is it that the congregation participates not only in the reading of Scripture, but specifically the preaching of scripture. Again, if you're anything like me, it's probably not something you've thought a whole lot about. Because generally when we think of preaching and even reading scripture, we think that's what the pastor, that's what the elder is doing. They're doing it and I'm sitting and listening. But what are we actually called to do? So first, let's consider reading the word. Reading the word as a distinct element in our service of worship. Reading the scriptures, we find throughout the Bible that in the congregation there was a reading of either the law or reading of the scriptures more generally. I'm not going to read all of these passages, but here are just a few. Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. This is the scene at Sinai. Then he took the book of the covenant, that is Moses, and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. Skip down to Nehemiah there, Nehemiah chapter 8. That's that glorious scene where the priests read before the people. They erect this platform so that the people, the congregation, can hear. We read this. They read from the book, that is, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense, that is, of the book, so that the people understood the reading. 
So there are some Old Testament texts for warrant for when the congregation gathers to worship God, there is a reading of Scripture, not just the reading of Scripture for the sermon, though that's appropriate, of course, but an actual distinct element of getting the Scriptures before the people. What about in the New Testament? Again, in the the context of the synagogue worship, we read in Luke chapter 4, and Jesus came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, again, remember, this is the Old Covenant Sabbath, so this is Saturday, and he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And then, quoting from the Old Testament. And then Acts chapter 13, we'll do two more here. Acts 13, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on to Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And then 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's words to Timothy, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. So here are some Scripture texts for having this Scripture reading going on in our public services of worship. Again, one more time to quote the directory of our denomination. It says this, Because the hearing of God's Word is a means of grace... That is, it is a means by which God builds up his church. The public reading of the Holy Scriptures is an essential element of public worship. He who performs this this serves as God's representative voice. Through this reading, God speaks directly to the congregation in his own words. For this reason, the reader should refrain from interspersing the reading of God's word with human comments. He should use an accurate, faithful translation in the language of the people. He should read clearly and with understanding. And the congregation should attend to the reading with the deepest reverence. So there again, just to emphasize that fact that yes, the reader is reading the scriptures. There's also something the congregation is to do. Namely, to read, to listen with deepest reverence. A question for us before we look at really the manner in which the scriptures are to be read and then the way in which we should respond Just considering this question, beyond the warrant found in Scripture, so we've just seen Scripture commands this to take place, why might the public reading of the Scriptures be an important facet for public worship? What else? What other reasons might be uh, as to why reading the Scriptures in worship is an important part of our corporate gatherings? Comments, thoughts, questions uh, related uh, to that question. What do you guys think? What are some other reasons that might be given? So it sets sort of a primacy. It reminds us that we can only really know God. We can only really know what he's calling us to do through his word. So it's reminding us there of the primacy of Scripture. So reorienting us maybe in that sense. Anything else? Anything else come to mind? Why might it be important? Yeah, so it is God's word, it is God speaking to his people. So again, just the importance of the fact that if God's people, just thinking logically, if God's people were to gather, what would you want to happen? You would want to hear God's word. So just, just in terms of obviousness, we might even say, that would be a vital part of the scriptures. Just something, yeah, go ahead. 
Very good. So we're called to live by the word of God. Jesus even picks up on that in the, in the temptations. So God's word is to have this sort of controlling effect over the congregation. It's to be the guide for God's people. So we would imagine if God's people, again, are gathering, it's going to be God and his word directing the people as to how they should live. And just th- pra- Even practically thinking about this, how many of us throughout the week you know, we, we all say we, we are to read the scriptures and to pray. That's an important part of our Christian life. But how many of us this week didn't have the time or didn't give the time to that activity? It's probably happened in many of us. We just, there other things crowded it out. And whether that's something that we certainly need to, to work on to prioritize, it's the reality of the case. Sometimes other things crowd out what we believe still to be most important. And so we have a day, again. In God's grace and in his mercy, here's a day where when God's people are going to gather, whatever happened in your life this week, you may have only read the scriptures for five minutes the whole week. Here's a day the Lord is saying that I'm going to communicate to you through my word. And whatever happened, five minutes, five hours of reading, you're going to have devoted time to reading the scriptures. And so those in the past have really advocated, and again, there's differences as to how this is going to happen, but they've advocated for not just reading a verse or two. You know, if you go into just sort of an average church on the block, they might start and, you know, open up the service of worship and just read like sort of a random passage of encouragement. And then beyond that, there's not really going to be substantial portions of reading God's word. You might have the sermon, which could be topical, and there might be a verse sort of taken out of a section. But if you really think about it, it's very unpopular in services of worship to actually have substantial portions of God's word read. And so those of our forefathers in the past have really advocated for not just reading two or three verses here or there as words of encouragement, but reading a portion of scripture. And I would even say they would argue as well, certainly, reading them consecutively from week to week so that when you think about it, you, you know, you, you grow up in the church and maybe 10 years, you've read through, just by being in church, you've read through large portions of the Bible. And that's just distinct from the sermons you're now going to hear, which are going to cover, again, either in a series or something like that. You're going to cover large portions. So the, the point is, we're just throwing scripture. We're consistently saturating the people with God's word in the service of worship. Anything else come to mind just practically thinking about the importance of the word? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great. And you even see that there in Nehemiah. They read from the book. And then they're not just like coming up with their own random thoughts. They gave the sense of it. So they're just expounding the scriptures. Because again, as sort of everybody has been, I think, getting at, it's, the, it's God's word that is to be our sort of direction, our guide in life. It's our ultimate authority in life. And so, yeah, it is right and proper for the people of God uh, to do this corporately. We also see in the catechism, I think, just some helpful questions. Um, certainly some would be, will be familiar with these. But just to think about, again, in our sort of tradition, again, drawing upon the principles laid forth in Scripture, the Westminster Larger Catechism describes the way in which the manner in which the Word of God is to be read. So a distinct question, how is the Word of God to be read? So this is more describing those who read it. The Holy Scriptures are to be read with a high and reverent esteem of them, with a firm persuasion that they are the very Word of God, and that He only can enable us to understand them, with desire to know, believe, and obey the will of God revealed in them, with diligence and attention to the matter and scope of them, with meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. So those are, for those reading the Scriptures, that's a great question just to ponder when you're going to read a passage of Scripture in the service of worship, you know, These are some things to think about. But then also, the catechism helpfully describes how should the people hear the word. Again, I want to to just keep emphasizing this because if you're anything like me, you don't give much time 
to thinking about how should I as the listener respond. I know what the pastor should be doing, but what am I to be doing? Well, Shorter Catechism 90. How is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend and thereunto, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Receive it with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. That's a wonderful, a wonderful catechism question to just reflect on as the listener. When's the last time, honestly, can we say, when is the last time that we have prepared to hear the word of God read? Now, again, we could say all week we're preparing in terms of our sanctification, but when is the last time you or I gave conscious preparation and even prayer prior to the reading of Scripture in the service of worship or even the preaching, as we'll come to in a few minutes? Preparing for that, praying that the Lord would bless his word. And then, even more challenging for myself, how many of us, after church, throughout the rest of the week, give any thought to what actually happened in the service of worship? Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to call you out, per se, because I'm in the same boat. But honestly, can we say we really reflect on the scriptures? We really seek to apply the scriptures the scriptures that were read in church, the scriptures that were preached on in the service of worship. If you're, again, if you're anything like me, I think oftentimes these sorts of things that were, that were spoken of here in our catechism, we don't really give much thought to during our week. We come to church, we come for the hour, we leave, and it's almost as if what just happened has no bearing upon the rest of our lives. Now, that's not to say we don't continue to gather throughout the week and discuss and have Bible studies and things like that. But honestly, it's so challenging for me to think about, do I really meditate on the sermon throughout the week? Do I really think about, do I pray before the service, asking God's blessing upon our service? Comment? Question? Sure. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, and that's a great point. There is something that does, yeah, there is something missing, and I think Christians will, ex will experience that. I mean, just think about COVID, right? For, you know, again, different views on exactly what, what went on there, but those first few weeks or those first few months, we all recognize this isn't, this isn't right. There's something wrong here because we're meant to be together and you're, you, you do feel that, I think. You do feel that in sort of an experiential way throughout the week when you haven't been able to gather with God's people. So that's a great point to certainly keep in mind. Any other thoughts or comments before we look? Again, that just, we're just skimming the surface here of reading the scriptures, uh, but think about preaching uh, for just a few moments. Any other thoughts, though, before in terms of reading? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Great example. So Acts 17, uh, the Bereans are examining the scriptures. So they're, they're thinking about it. They're really meditating on what they've heard and seeking, presumably seeking in, in terms of that examining, seeking to apply it to their lives, thinking about what does this really mean for me and my unique vocation or calling in life. Um, so great example. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Any other uh, final comments or thoughts? Not really. Uh, worship, but actually before, I'm 62. Uh, before I started coming to church, I would come Yeah, and that's, an, that's a really important principle, too, that the sheer reading of the scriptures, when we, we realize that 
this isn't man's word, but the, the actual act of just reading the scriptures is actually having an effect on the listener. Whether you do actually do anything with it, so to speak, it's, you know, Paul can speak about something being an aroma of life or an aroma of death. The very word of God is having an impact on the people. So the sheer fact of just reading it is a wonderful thing. That can be in the public school, that can be in your home, but certainly it would be in the church. It's an important facet of the worship service. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's a wonderful reminder to not just the Christian, it's encouraging, it's uplifting, but it's even a call to the non-Christian, to your friends or whatever it is. In a Bible study where non-believers are coming, it's a call to them as well. That this God, this God is a this is a serious business, a solemn matter. God exists and he doesn't and he doesn't keep himself quiet, but he does speak to his people. One more, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, mean, I certainly would want to emphasize now the, the past two comments. Again, just to reiterate, the simple, sheer, call it simple, but the sheer fact of reading the scriptures has an impact. And so we should, we should want that to be a real central feature of our church's life. Let me move just briefly, again, just for keep things moving here, um, in terms of preaching the word. And really, we... I think we, we know this, but just to give one text to highlight the centrality of the preaching of the word in Romans chapter 10, a familiar text, certainly, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? So just, just one text, we could certainly come up with some more, but the, the centrality of preaching and so right, we rightly emphasize the importance of preaching the word as a means by which not only the lost are converted, but the converted are built up. So sinners made saints, saints built up in sanctification. And if you were to ask, I think, generally Christians, uh, how do you grow most in your life, spiritually speaking? Would the answer be preaching? through the hearing of the preached word. I'm not sure that that would be high up on the list. Maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't. I think from my experience, probably it, it probably wouldn't be in terms of conversations I've had with people. They would say that the, the best way that I grow is Sunday morning hearing the sermon. I'm not sure that's the, that's the average Christian uh, response. But... Given the, given the centrality of the, of the preaching of the word in scripture, I think that should be how we think of it. That whatever takes place in our weeks after Sunday morning, Sunday evening worship of hearing the word is sort of the overflow effect of that sort of central reality of that preaching of the word, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. That is the Bible studies to which we attend are going to be means by which we are built up. But they're, 
They're only useful, if I could put it this way, and maybe, maybe, you, could, maybe you could say I, I disagree with you on this, but those things are only useful, as it were, in terms of their outpouring from the pulpit. I'm just getting at the fact that the pulpit is the central part of the people of God's life, and all of these other means are flowing out of that. And so the fact, again, that Paul can say, how are they to believe? if they've never heard, and how are they to hear unless somebody preaches? So preaching, again, for the people of God is an important part, I would say the central part for our Christian growth, and all of these other good things in our lives are just the overflow of that central reality. Now just, again, as we did with reading, I want to just think very briefly upon the manner of preaching, because there's questions in the catechism about that, but more specifically for us, as we hear the preaching of the word, what should, we th- what should we be thinking about? Just briefly, the manner of preaching. Again, there's a catechism question 159 in the larger catechism. How is the word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? They that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine diligently, in season and out of season, plainly, not in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, faithfully making known the whole counsel of God, wisely applying themselves to the necessities and capacities of the hearers, zealously with fervent love to God and the souls of his people, sincerely aiming at his glory in their conversion, edification, and salvation. Again, that's something that preachers need to think about, but also the listeners, we need to realize that this is what, this is how the word is to be preached. But what I want to just spend the last few minutes thinking about is how can we respond as the listener to the preaching of the word? What, what is sort of a framework for thinking about this important, as I hope to have shown, this important, this vitally important part of our spiritual life? How should we hear the word? Again, larger catechism asks this, 160. What is required of those that hear the word preached? It is required of those that hear the word preached that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Examine what they hear by the scriptures. Receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the word of God. Meditate and confer of it, hide it in their hearts, and bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. So again, that, that's worthy of our reflection. I would encourage you to think about that even before Sunday morning comes, just to read through that question and think about some of those important parts. But I came across this article this week, and we'll close with some of these practical helps. This is an article that was written, a website called Reformation 21, uh, by Philip Riken. Some of you will know that name. Philip Riken just, he has this really nice article. He's saying, Here are some practical helps for when you listen to sermons. And this will likely not be new for us. But just think about these. I'm not saying that this is mandate, uh, that you don't don't have to do these things. But these are some helpful tips that he came up with. Um, I think good, good things to think about for us to really embrace the preaching and seek to apply it to our lives as we go forth from this place. So here are just a few things that I'm, I'm taking from from this article, I think he may have more in there or less, but I'm sort of giving it my own sort of twist here. First, his quote. He says, what is the right way to listen to a sermon? It is with a soul that is prepared, a mind that is alert, a Bible that is open, a heart that is receptive, and a life that is ready to spring into action. So here are a few things. Here's five on the list. First, read the passage ahead of time and pray for the Lord's blessing. Did you notice that theme, both in the shorter catechism and in the larger catechism? To prepare and to pray. And that's extremely challenging for me. Because if you're preaching the word, the hope is that you'll be praying over the text throughout the week. But ask yourself the same question that I had to ask myself going through this. When is the last time I prayed on, say, Saturday night? that the Lord would bless the preaching of the word. Something for us to think about. The catechism certainly seems like this is an important part of truly hearing the word of God preached. 
and you really will likely know the next text because if my understanding is correct, generally the, the main diet of preaching in this church is consecutive preaching. So we just finished Luke chapter 1, verse 25. The next section will begin at verse 26 and read Saturday night, next Saturday. Read through the, the first chapter of Luke and pray briefly, Lord, would you prepare my heart to hear that word tomorrow? Secondly, have your Bibles open when the pastor is preaching. I would encourage you either to bring your own Bible to church or to use the Pew Bibles. Um, I, I was reading a number, of, uh, maybe a couple years ago, and specifically the author was highlighting in terms of preaching, he says how important it is for you to see what the pastor is saying in the text. Because it's really not about primarily you know, if the pastor has really good ideas, but if they're not really grounded in the text, then honestly take it or leave it. They may be wise principles, but if they're not really rooted in Scripture, well, again, I think, again, maybe they're useful, but again, we're, we're seeking to cultivate a life under God's Word. If you don't have your Bible open when the pastor is preaching, again, I recognize there's reasons that you may not be able to, but Generally speaking, if you're able to and there aren't you know, major distractions, maybe you have kids in the pew or something like that and you're just not able to in a season of life, but if you're able to, I would encourage you to bring your own Bible or to use the pew Bible and to follow along. Even this morning it was very clear. Pastor Claude was just following the text, walking down the text. See it for yourself. It's really important to, to see the text for yourself. Thirdly, Riken encourages taking notes. Again, taking notes is not for everybody. Not everybody learns the same way. I remember hearing a story about somebody telling about his, I think it was his child, and he encouraged them all to take notes. And his one child couldn't retain a single thing in the sermon until later on in his life he realized he stopped taking notes and he, he could spit off just like that. Certain people are wired differently. But generally, I think this is helpful wisdom. If you're able to, you even have an outline. It's wonderful. You have an outline in your bulletin. Follow along with pencil in hand if you're able. Again, there are challenges that might prohibit somebody from doing that. But if you're able to, um, taking notes is one way for you to see the words being written down and to retain them in your mind. Fourthly, this is a real challenge, I think, for people in the pews. Pray for humility to be a learner rather than a critiquer. Another thing that I, I, I certainly have to wrestle with this myself, it is far easier, and I think we can all honestly say this to each other, it's far easier to critique the message than to actually embrace what the message was saying. I think we can all honestly say that. It's very easy to critique. And I'll be honest, there is a time for that. If my sermon is really no good, I don't want you really to come up and say, that was a wonderful sermon. You know, maybe not Sunday you can come up and you know, bash it in, but maybe throughout the week and say, you know, Brian, that, you know, I don't really think what the text was saying is really what you were drawing out. There's a time for that. But if we're honest, it's much easier to critique than it is to sort of embrace wholeheartedly what, what's being preached. So I would, I would encourage all of us to think about that, to pray for humility, to say, when the word goes forth, you may have your own views as to maybe he should have emphasized that and not that. Okay, there's a place for that. I, I am absolutely in favor. There is room for growth for those who preach the word, especially if somebody like me who's a lot younger, inexperienced. So there's a place for that. But I would encourage you to sort of humbly submit because ultimately this is the word of God that's going forth. And then fifthly, Seek to cultivate time in your life to talk about the sermon or even the worship service as a whole, to talk about it and to seek to apply it. Again, this is difficult. You could spend probably an entire course on how do you apply the scriptures in a practical way. But there's a whole tradition. There's a whole tradition in, in sort of our circles in days gone by of folks who would congregate after the service at, a folk, at somebody's home, have a cup of coffee, and they would designate time just to talk about the sermon. I'm not saying that we have to do that. There's nowhere in Scripture that mandates that. But maybe that's a helpful way. Just invite somebody over. And rather than talking about, as we, we all do, let's be honest, we all do it, rather than talking about whatever thing went on this week that is good, right? The Lord brought us through that. We're thankful for that. 
do we, do we talk about the sermon very often? Probably not. And if we do, as one has said, we usually, talk, we usually have the pastor for lunch. That is, we critique him for our lunch rather than actually talking about what was good from the sermon. Again, we're all, I think, in some capacity, if you're like me, I don't want to presume, but if you're like me, guilty of this. And so I think these are very helpful ways for us to think about how do we listen to the sermon and actually benefit from it. Just summarizing them one more time, and then if there are any comments or questions, we can close with those. Read the passage ahead of time and pray for the Lord's blessing. Two, have your Bibles open when the pastor is preaching and follow the text. Three, if you're able, take notes. Four, pray for humility to be a learner rather than a critiquer. And five, seek to apply the scriptures and talk about the sermons when you're able with folks in the church and maybe folks outside. Any comments, questions, complaints? I think that's the right. I usually, I've, I've heard that before. Comments, questions, or complaints before we close. All right, I'll be expecting the critiques tomorrow then. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me, let me get that, the church phone number, and Pastor Taylor can answer. And <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, for this time uh, to reflect maybe areas that some of us haven't thought about much, but Lord, important parts of our lives. We, we, want, to be, we want to be active in our worship. We want to be those who are seeking to, to worship you rightly, but also seeking to worship you rightly throughout the week. And one of the, one, one of the wonderful ways that we can do that is to cultivate a culture, cultivate a church that seeks to talk about these things that we have been able to participate in each Lord's Day. We thank you, O Lord, for this time, and we ask that you richly bless us this day, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.